evening. 15 years ago, a comet hit the giant planet Jupiter and produced very obvious events. And now there's been another impact on Jupiter, and we're going to talk about it. But first of all, Jupiter itself. With me, two experts, Drs. David Rothery and John Rogers. Welcome to the sky at night. Thank Hello, you, Patrick. John, can you give us a brief rundown about Jupiter? Well, Patrick, Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system, a gas giant, uh, and indeed it's typical of many planets that are now being discovered in, uh, in the galaxy around other stars as well. So when we study Jupiter, we're studying the one representative that we have of a very widespread class of astronomical object. So what we see on Jupiter is basically the top of a very deep and dense atmosphere. Uh, what you see through a telescope uh, initially is dark belts and bright zones running across the disk. Uh, and those are all cloud features, and the reason they're there is because of the very powerful winds in the atmosphere. Uh, so we now know that there are jet streams running at maybe 100 miles an hour, 200 miles an hour, along the edges of all those belts and zones, which confine the cloud systems within them. Um, the zones contain great anticyclones, of which the Great Red Spot is the most familiar and the biggest. Uh, the belts contain cyclonic disturbances, and like cyclones on Earth, those tend to be the areas where you get weather systems and quite vigorous disturbances. Sometimes we see storms em erupting within the belts, on time scale of just a few days. Why is the red spot red? Well, that we still don't know, unfortunately. But we think that it may be because it is so big and therefore deep. Uh, there is a theory that red spots, particularly the great red spot, are dragging up some vapour from very deep in the atmosphere, uh, and this vapour then turns red on exposure to sunlight. There are other red spots as well, and this is one of the things that we've been observing recently on Jupiter. Um, just three years ago, one of its previously white ovals, another big anticyclone, actually turned red. And the key thing about those seems to be that they are large and also that they're quite long-lived. And so it may be that those are the ovals that extend deepest into the atmosphere. What about the interior of Jupiter? Well, we know that it's hot, and a lot of heat comes from the interior and actually helps to drive the weather systems. There's about as much heat that comes from the interior as is received from the sun. So uh, there is certainly some convection driven from the heat from below, uh, and we think that this is one of the main reasons why there is weather on Jupiter, and indeed why disturbances appear in the atmosphere, and then ultimately the, that provides the energy that drives the winds. And, uh, Dave, um... Jupiter does have a strong magnetic field. Absolutely. It has much the strongest magnetic field of, of any of the planets. But unlike the Earth, its field doesn't appear to be generated in a, a, a liquid core made largely of iron. It seems to be generated outside the centre of the planet in, in a shell that we think is probably made of hydrogen, but hydrogen compressed to a density such that it, it behaves like a metal. The electrons are free to move around, so it's electrically conducting and the planet's rapid rotation creates a dynamo effect, and that's the seat of a very, very strong magnetic field, which is what confines the radiation belts around the planet, which makes it such a dangerous place for a spacecraft to linger. Now, let's come on to the impact. Fifteen years ago, comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 hit Jupiter and produced very obvious effects. And we knew it was going to happen because the comet had been seen captured into orbit around Jupiter and it was predicted to hit Jupiter um, several weeks after its discovery, so everybody was lined up, ready to watch the impacts as they happened. A great deal was deduced about the nature of the comet, uh, and it's now known that each of the fragments that hit Jupiter were just a few hundred metres across, the largest no more than a kilometre across. Now, of course, we have this new impact. Yes, this was discovered quite unexpectedly on July the 19th by Anthony Wesley, who is uh, an expert amateur astronomer in Australia, and he saw this intensely dark little spot in the South Polar region where there had been nothing there two days before. What size was this thing that hit Jupiter? It was probably just a few hundred metres across, equivalent to one of the mid-sized uh, SL9 impacts. But do we know what the dark stuff is that all these impacts distribute into the atmosphere? Well, basically, it's a kind of smoke. When the comet approaches, it comes in at extremely high speed, plunges down through the atmosphere and explodes down under the visible cloud tops. Uh, and that explosion then throws up an enormous great plume, 3,000 kilometres high. That was actually imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope at several impacts uh, in 1994. And then, as the plume splashes back onto the top of the atmosphere, the combination of the explosion and this super-hot splashback incinerate all the molecules in the comet and in the atmosphere, and what comes out of it is a kind of carbonaceous smoke which is drifting on top of the stratosphere. Well, I wonder, 
We'd hope to give you some views from the telescopes and my observatory tonight. And outside, we have uh, Pete Lawrence, um, electronic imaging, and Paul Abel, who depends more upon drawing. Let's go and see how they're getting on. Now, without doubt, the real star of the show at the moment is the planet Jupiter. And the reason for this is simply that the planet gets to the highest point it can in the sky in the hours running up to midnight throughout September. Now, don't get too excited about this because it's still quite low down for us. But where the planet has been high in the sky for the southern hemisphere and low in the sky for the northern hemisphere, that balance is now starting to shift and it's getting higher in our sky and lower in theirs. Now, the planet is very easy to find. If you go out in the hours running up to midnight, look due south, scan along the southern part of the horizon, and the brightest dot you can see, quite low down, is Jupiter. It looks intensely bright, but is very easy to see. Now, it may look fantastic with the naked eye, but put a pair of binoculars on it, and you'll see it's got four tiny pinpricks of light around it. Those are the four largest moons of Jupiter, the so-called Galilean moons. But things really start to get exciting when you turn a telescope on it. <laughs> oh, Peter, it's not looking very good, is it? That looks awful, doesn't it? I mean, it's total cloud cover at the moment, which is a real shame. But what you're going to be doing is looking at Jupiter, but you're also going to be recording it, but you're not going to be using any of the newfangled stuff uh, which I'd use at no, all. No, I'm not doing it your way, I'm doing it the proper way. OK. And it just so happens I have a drawing here that I made of Jupiter on Monday the 13th of July. It's the amount there. of detail you've got there is incredible. So how would you go about making a sketch like that? Well, first of all, I take one of these, which is Jupiter blank. The first thing I do is use my pencils. I put in the darker belt, so southern equatorial belt. Northern. So are these special pencils or they're just normal? I do it all on the cheap, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> these are normal pencils. Uh, yeah, only cost a couple of quid. I tend to use the 4B for the belts. Uh, so soft pencils you're soft using pencils. to draw the features on there. And then uh, 5B for the poles and just smudge it in to get that lovely dusky effect. Right, OK. So how long would it normally take you to complete a sketch? Oh, I'd like it to take hours in practice. It may not take any longer than 16 minutes because of Jupiter's rapid rotation, so I try to get it done in about 15 minutes. OK, well, I'm going to leave you to it. It doesn't look great at all, oh, but I'm going to go and have a look at my telescope and see if I can get myself set up as well. OK, I'll see you later. See you later. Well, against all odds, even though there were really thick clouds earlier on, I have actually managed to see Jupiter only for a brief moment of time. But the planet did come out, the clouds thinned enough for me to see it, and I did actually get it through the telescope. But not for long enough to really take or capture an image of it. Because what Paul is doing, Paul is using sketch pad and pencils to record Jupiter, but I'm using a completely different method. I've got a fairly sizeable telescope here. This is a 14-inch telescope. Now, there is a problem because the Earth's atmosphere gets in the way and the Earth's atmosphere wobbles the view considerably and that blurs any detail. So to get round that, what we do is we take lots and lots of pictures of the planet and we process them, we stack them and register them together and try and pull out the good bits. So to do that, we're using a special camera. It's called a high frame rate planetary camera. And the one I've got here is actually a mono camera, so it takes black and white images. Now, I want to take nice, colourful images of the planet. Now, a typical full colour image that you'll see on a computer screen or on a television screen is made up of three components, red, green and blue. So I've got a filter wheel here which is fitted with a red filter, a green filter and a blue filter. If I dial it round so that the particular filter is in the way of the camera, what I capture is the planet viewed through that filter. So with the red filter in there, I'm capturing the red detail of the planet. So I've got a red image, a green image and a blue image. I can use special software to combine them together and that gives me a full colour image, a full colour result. Now, whether the clouds are actually going to thin any more tonight, I'm not sure. It doesn't look particularly likely, to be honest. But I have seen it, so I'm quite happy. And I've just got fingers crossed I'll get another view before we pack it in. Well, not much luck so far, I'm afraid. We'll go back to Peter and Paul later on. Meanwhile, Jupiter's satellites were very interesting. Dave, would you give us a rundown on Jupiter's satellite family? Well, it's rather too big for a brief rundown, Patrick, because they're actually over 60 satellites that are known of Jupiter. 
but there are only four big ones, and they're the ones which particularly interest me as a geologist, because they are big, they're world size. They're as big as the Earth's moon, one is as big as the planet Mercury. And they were discovered almost exactly 400 years ago. And the chap given the credit usually is, is Galileo Galilei, and they're called the Galilean satellites in honour of him. And these are Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto in order outwards from Jupiter. Until the first major probe went there called Voyager, we expected them to be passive worlds just battered by impact cratering and so on. And one week before Voyager 1 arrived there, there was a paper published pointing out that there's a relationship between the orbits of these satellites which ought to be poking heat into their interior, and in particular into the interior of Io, and it was predicted that Io was going to be molten inside. And lo and behold, when Voyager 1 got there, it discovered volcanoes erupting on Io. And, and the reason for this heat that's going in is a process called tidal heating. It's very complex in detail, but you have satellites orbiting a, a planet that has a very strong gravitational field. It's the most massive planet in the solar system. And the satellites are all quite close to Jupiter, so they're experiencing very strong tidal forces. Now, these tidal forces would not be doing very much to the interiors, except that the orbits are being kept from becoming exactly circular by the orbital resonance between the satellites. For every four orbits that Io makes, Europa makes two orbits, and Ganymede makes one orbit. And that means that they overtake each other at the same point in each orbit. And because of that, the tidal stresses on their interiors are, are waxing and waning with each orbit. And that internal deformation is putting heat into their interiors. And it's putting so much heat into the interior of Io that uh, it's got volcanoes erupting. And volcanoes erupting molten rock. It's, Io isn't an ice-covered body like the other satellites. If, if it ever was ice-covered, it's lost all the ice because of the heat. When you see images from the probes that have visited Jupiter, uh, you see plumes that are cast into space for two or three hundred kilometres, and that's, that's fragments of, of basalt rock fragmented by the expansion of sulphur dioxide gas. And on the surface, you see lava flowing across the ground, glowing red hot in some cases, and that is molten lava. Coming further out, what about Europa? Europa, when we saw it with Voyager in the 70s and early 80s, looked a fairly bland place. Not many craters, fairly smooth surface with, with, with cracks running across it. We got much higher resolution images from the Galileo mission, which was able to pass close to Europa several times, unlike Io, and it revealed um, absolutely fascinating surface to me. Um, Europa is probably a, an ice-covered version of Io. Imagine something that's rock, maybe an iron core inside it, with about 100 to 150 kilometres of icy material on the outside. And the question that has exercised most people has been, is this ice frozen all the way down? Do we have frozen ice sitting on top of the rocky interior, or is the lower part of the ice liquid, so water? What do you and think? I think it's almost certainly a, a salty ocean below the ice, because the Galileo images that really clinch this are the ones that show regions of a type of terrain referred to as chaos. But what it shows is that the surface of Europa has broken apart, has been melt through from beneath, if you like, exposing the ocean, and the ice, the thin ice at the edge of a temporarily exposed ocean has broken apart, and rafts of ice have drifted into what was an ocean, which is now refrozen, and possibly if you have photosynthetic organisms living in the ocean, yes. they could earn a living from sunlight when it, when the cracks are open. What do you think about life inside your Joel? Well, it is a possibility. As mm. I'm actually a biologist myself, <laughs> and uh, it's thought that life originated on Earth, um, possibly in the deep ocean, where there are hot springs producing lots of minerals and as well as, well as warmth. Uh, the same situation could well exist in the ocean of Europa. Uh, because the tidal heating could be operating deep within the core of the moon uh, and therefore there could be undersea volcanoes in Europa as there are on Earth. Well, I wonder. Dave, John, thank you very much. Thank you. And now um, back to the observatory outside. I wonder how Pete and Paul are getting on. So the weather hasn't been particularly kind tonight. The clouds have remained in place and we haven't had much of a view. They did thin just enough to be able to pick up Jupiter earlier on, but it was a very fleeting glimpse and it wasn't long enough for me to actually be able to take a proper image of it. But it was fantastic to be able to see the planet anyway. Now, 
I have images which I've taken on previous occasions. I've got one here which was taken on the 25th of July, which shows the impact scar which was discovered by Anthony Wesley in Australia. Now, Paul, I know you've got some sketches which you took at around the same time. Yes, and more importantly, around the same longitude. So we can compare the sketch and the image which we've got here and see which features actually line up on it. Yes, yeah, so let's see how we're doing. So, I mean, look at the, you've got some lovely detail in the Northern Equatorial Belt. They're there. remarkably close, actually, I have it's to say. It's not bad, is it? But it's quite a comfort to know that using two separate techniques that we have actually got this correlation between them. It, and because one thing which has always worried me slightly about sketching is the fact that it's, it's a very subjective art. It is, like. but uh, both imaging and uh, drawing are subjective in that both require a human brain to do the processing. They do, but what I would say is that I've seen images which have been taken by different people I and mean, when you compare them if they are seasoned images then they've used different processes but the images look very very close lots of seasoned astronomers drew the canals on mars peter it's not enough what you really need is more than one data collection the more ways you have collecting data and observations, the better. It really will reduce that error and it, risk. That's absolutely true, except that I would say with the, the data on Mars, of course, that's that suggestion which is actually convincing people to see the canals. But with a camera, you can't suggest but, anything of it. But you can suggest in the post-processing things that may not be there. That's absolutely true. So what's really important is that we've got both methods which we can use to work out what are actually real features. Yes, what is actually happening on these planets, yes. Absolutely, that's fantastic. So, tonight, we've still got a thick cloud yeah. above us. So what do you reckon? Oh, I think we should call it a night, don't you? Should we go and get a cup of coffee? That sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pete did have one brief glimpse through cloud, but um, not very much. You can't win them all. And now, onto our news notes with Chris. First of all, spirit and opportunity are still roaming around Mars, and uh, they've found one very interesting meteorite. Yes, a meteorite on the surface of Mars. It was Opportunity that spotted it. Opportunity, of course, is en route to Endeavour Crater, 12 miles from its previous home at Victoria. It's about a fifth of the way there. It's a long drive for the rover. But on its way, it zoomed past a rather interesting rock. In fact, it got about 600 feet past it before it got the command to go back and take a, a closer look. And this turns out to be a meteorite, the largest we've ever seen on Mars. Uh, the rock itself is about 60 centimetres, so it's about that size. It's a, a substantial thing, and in fact, it's so large um, that had it hit Mars' atmosphere today, when it hit the ground, it would have been moving at such a rate that it would have shattered into many pieces. And it didn't do that, so it must have landed at a time when Mars' atmosphere was thicker. Now, we know Mars' atmosphere was thick billions of years ago, so this thing may just have been sitting there waiting for us for all of that time. Or, if it hit recently, that tells us that Mars' atmosphere must have been thick recently, and there must have been recent climate change on Mars, perhaps due to changing of the orbital inclination or something like that. So what we need to do is work out when this meteorite fell. And Opportunity is taking a very, very close look, looking for variations on the surface that might give us clues as to to when that happened. Tell how much erosion there is. For I example. just wonder. My guess is it's fairly recent. Well, I hope so. That would be a fascinating discovery. Chris, I've been looking at a particularly lovely photograph. That of the Triffid Nebula. Yes, this is from the European Southern Observatory's 2.2-metre telescope down in Chile. It's a stunning image of, well, a nearby star formation region. You can see the red gas um, shining away there, the blue reflection of light, presumably from young stars embedded within the object, and then the dust lanes that give the object its name over the top. Absolutely beautiful. It really is breathtaking. Chris, thank you very much. And when we come back next month, we'll be talking about the great space observatories. So until then, good night. Mm -hmm.